This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. If you only had one car for the rest of your life, you'd take really great care of it. Well, we only have one brain in life. Visit betterhelp.com super and take care of one of the most important parts of you, your mind. Hey, brother. Quite possibly the most important date in the entire wizarding world has got to be October 31st, 1981. The day that the boy who lived lived. There is an entire seven book series that revolves around the aftermath of the events of this very particular night. And yet the night that baby Harry defeated the Dark Lord is wrought with all sorts of problems and mysteries, basically from the word go. Right out of the gate, there's just the timing of the thing. Like, why does Voldemort attack on specifically Halloween? Is there something attached to that date? Or is he just trying to be like the inspiration for a future horror movie or something? Lord Voldemort, known super fan, of trick-or-treating. From there, there's also the great looming question of just how does everyone know what happened at the Potter's house that night so quickly? The home had been under the Fidelius charm, and at this point in time, nobody even realized that Voldemort had an affinity for trick-or-treating yet. Beyond that, we also have just the general inquiry, which is why does it take so long for Hagrid to get from the Potter's house to Privet Drive to deliver him to the Dursleys? After all, we know that McGonagall is posted up in front of their house for a whole day before Dumbledore and Hagrid arrive. I've watched them all day. They're the worst sort of muggles imaginable. They truly are, Professor. They truly are. Either way, with Halloween fast approaching out here in the real world, we thought it would be fun to once again wade back into the cool autumn air of October 31st, 1981 and figure out exactly what happened. Now, the day of November 1st, 1981 is a bit of an unusual one as well, as fireworks could be seen all throughout England. Owls were flying by daylight, and an unusual number of robed men and women were out celebrating. And it's all in the name of Harry James Potter, the one-year-old boy who defeated the Dark Lord. The mystery of Harry's survival on that particular evening is the driving mystery behind the majority of the Harry Potter series, and yet by the end of it, a lot of the events of this particular evening are still kind of unknown to us. For example, we know that the news of Voldemort's defeat started spreading like almost instantly, which is very surprising for a few different reasons. First of all, Voldemort in general, like his MO is operating in secrecy, especially when it comes to his own personal projects. Like ain't nobody knows who he's gonna be for Halloween until 1031. I like to think that he was sporting a fake mustache on this particular evening. <laughs> but also for real, for example, all throughout Deathly Hallows, he doesn't tell any of his Death Eaters that he's on a quest for the Elder Wand. And he even privately thinks to himself, but to be sure, to be utterly sure, he must return to each of his hiding places. He must redouble protection around each of his Horcruxes, a job like the quest for the Elder Wand that he must undertake alone. Why can he alone visit the Horcruxes? Because he alone knows that they exist. In his mind, this is the only way to to keep them safe. If any of his Death Eaters knew, they might try to seize them and power. In fact, proof of this very idea comes in the form of Regulus Black. We know that Voldemort requests the use of Creature to hide the locket. Regulus, of course, had no idea what use Creature was going to be put to, but after his return, he very quickly discovers that he's making Horcruxes and sets out to destroy them. Regulus obviously doesn't live very long after this discovery, but he is one of the only living people to have ever discovered it in the first place. Voldemort does trust both Bell Bellatrix and Lucius to guard a couple of his Horcruxes, but neither of them actually knows what they are, which as usual is of course part of Voldemort's downfall. Can you even imagine how absolutely impossible it would have been to track down that diary if Lucius hadn't just brought it forth? I bring all of this up though, because it is Dumbledore's belief that Voldemort intended to make his last Horcrux with the destruction of Harry Potter. He seemed to have reserved the process of making Horcruxes for particularly significant deaths. You would have certainly been that. He believed that in killing you, he was destroying the danger the prophecy had outlined. He believed that he was making himself invincible. I am sure that he was intending to make his final Horcrux with your death. As such, his quest to kill Harry would have been an immense secret of Voldemort's. I'm sure that the other Death Eaters knew that Voldemort wanted the Potters dead, but I don't think they would have known why. 
In fact, the only person who seems to have even known the date that Voldemort was planning to attack at all is Peter Pettigrew. And that's because we know that on the night of the Potter's death, he was in hiding. But we will get back to him in just a couple more minutes. Speaking of Peter and the Fidelius charm though, even though Peter and Voldemort do know the actual location of the Potters, the secret is very much still intact for everyone else. So basically what we have here is Voldemort, who is on a secret quest on a seemingly random evening to kill someone who is named in a super secret prophecy in a home that is literally hidden by the Fidelius charm. We, of course, know that he fails on this particular evening, but what doesn't make sense to me is how Professor McGonagall knows to be stationed outside of the Dursley's home by the next morning. Like, it hasn't even been eight hours and people are celebrating in the streets. But it kind of seems to me like that the fact that he failed here should have remained a mystery. Right? Sure, he killed the Potters and Harry is alive, but why does this immediately translate to the fall of the Dark Lord? And how do people start figuring it out or finding out? The answer is, surprisingly, Bethilda Bagshot and the broken Fidelius charm. Let's talk about the Fidelius charm first. What happens when the subject of said charm dies. Harry himself actually wonders this exact same thing 16 years later when he ultimately returns to Godric's Hollow. It turns out he can, in fact, see the house, and he assumes the reason is because he could see it. The Fidelius charm must have died with James and Lily. I mean, that's easy enough, right? Like, the subjects died, but Actually, no, it's more complicated than that. The whole point of hiding the Potters in the first place isn't James and Lily. It's, of course, Harry, the subject of the prophecy. He is the chosen one. I am the chosen one. By Voldemort. And the Order of the Phoenix knows this because Snape has told Dumbledore. So what's kind of interesting here is that it means that Harry himself is not the subject of the Fidelius charm. It's just James and Lily. Because if Harry is correct in his assumption here and Harry had been the subject of the charm, then it couldn't have broken when James and Lily died because Harry is still alive. It's basic math, I think. But since the whole point of all of this is to protect Harry and he's not actually the subject, of the Fidelius charm, then it means that the charm must have been placed on James and Lily before he was born. Because otherwise you would just put him under the charm too, right? Although to be fair, it is a good thing that this is not the case. Otherwise there is no way that Hagrid could have ever found him. That is terrifying to think about. But it's not entirely hard to believe that they would have put them under the Fidelius charm before Harry was born. The prophecy states, the one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, born to those who have thrice defied him, born as the seventh month dies. This actually gets even more interesting because it means that when Snape approaches Dumbledore to tell him that Voldemort intends to hunt down the Potters and kill their child, he specifies their son, meaning Harry must have already been born. It's funny because it's Dumbledore's agreement to protect the Potters that actually gets Snape to switch over sides. What will you give me in exchange, Severus? Anything. But the thing is, Dumbledore must already be hiding them. And why wouldn't he be? It's pretty easy for Dumbledore to figure out which boys were born at the end of July, and there's only a small handful of members of the Order of the Phoenix. Dumbledore is the one who the prophecy was spoken to. He knows all of the people in play. He knows who the other candidate was. Why is it always me? Which is, of course, Neville, but what's really great about this is it means that Dumbledore is actually bluffing in this negotiation with Snape. He tricks him into switching sides on the basis of a promise that he has actually already put into motion. Like at home, this is like me doing the dishes and then my wife coming up to me and being like, hey, I'll put the baby down if you do the dishes. And I'm just like, Okay, joke's on me, story time's my favorite time of day. <laughs> and don't worry, if everything I've just said sounds confusing, it's because it is, and it doesn't even stop there. There's even more misinformation flying about within the wizarding world. For example, Cornelius Fudge knows even less. He explains to Madame Rosmerda, but James Potter insisted on using black, and then barely a week after the Fidelius charm had been performed, 
Black betrayed them? Now, obviously Fudge is wrong about Sirius being the secret keeper, but he's also wrong about when the Fidelius charm was cast in the first place, which isn't surprising because it's Cornelius Fudge. But also because in 1981, he was nine years away from becoming the Minister for Magic. So I'm not even sure like what claim he had to know this information in the first place or why he would have been involved at all. Because the truth is I super doubt he was. I can't imagine anybody letting him in the Order of the Phoenix. And beyond that, further proof that he is just flat out wrong comes in the form of Lily's letter to Sirius after Harry's first birthday. Lily says, James is getting a bit frustrated shit up here. He tries not to show it, but I can tell. So it sounds like they already can't leave the house. And this is three months prior to Halloween. She also goes on to say, Wormy was here last weekend. I thought he seemed down, but that was probably the news about the McKinnons. I cried all evening when I heard. Bathilda drops in most days. She's a fascinating old thing with the most amazing stories about Dumbledore. Couple of things here. First is that they are definitely already living in Godric's house because Bathilda is their neighbor in Godric's Hollow and she's already stopping by. Two, it means that Bathilda must know the secret location of the Potter's house because she's dropping by every day. Meaning Peter must have told her and possibly also Dumbledore because we know that Dumbledore had come by to collect James's cloak, which isn't a huge deal. We know that secret keepers are capable of revealing the secret to others. This is exactly how the members of the Order of the Phoenix know the location of number 12 Grimmauld Place, but can't actually share it with Harry themselves. Instead, what Moody has to do in order for Harry to see the location is hand him a slip of paper that has been handwritten by Dumbledore to tell him what he's looking at. In the case of the Potters, it all comes down to Peter, who is the secret keeper prime, if you will. Unless of course he dies, in which case anybody he had already told will then become secret keepers. In this particular instance, as far as we can tell, this would include Bathilda Bagshot and Dumbledore. But also the fact that Wormtail is able to visit during this particular occasion suggests that he is already the secret keeper because one, he would just know the location of where the Potters are and would be able to visit. But if it wasn't in effect, then he wouldn't even need to become the secret keeper because he obviously already knows where the Potters live and could just tell Voldemort anyway. But to be honest with you, what absolutely convinces me that the Fidelius Charm already had to be in effect is the fact that Sirius is not at Harry's first birthday when he is his godfather. And honestly, I will even just admit that I think this is kind of funny because there are like, laws of magic in play here. And it's the fact that Sirius didn't show up to his godson's birthday party that I am the most hung up on. There is just simply no way that Sirius is capable of going to this birthday party and does it. Ultimately though, this is just an incredibly long-winded way of explaining that the Potters must have been under the Fidelius charm for a very long time. Again, going back to Fudge's estimate that it had only been one week, it's more likely that it was over one year. This also must mean that Peter knew the location of the Potters for a long time. So when he ultimately told Voldemort is kind of unclear. But if you want our full thoughts on that matter, we have a lot of them. Full video by clicking the card. Guys, we need to take a quick minute to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Guys, it is officially October and therefore time to be geared up by Bespoke Post with their fall themed boxes of awesome. Personally, myself, I just got back from a fantastic weekend of backpacking where I took full advantage of my Damascus steel blade in my forge box. Everyone in my group's jaw dropped when they saw how beautiful and sharp and functional this blade actually was. After a long day of backpacking. Thanks to this blade, I put together some great shavings and we had a fire in no time flat. And amazingly, my bespoke post journey on this particular trip didn't even stop there. I also was able to keep warm at night thanks to their cocoon box. Inside of this box is this really cool blanket slash pillow slash sleeping bag that's just incredibly versatile. This blanket has both kept me warm on the trails and the same blanket I packed with me when I went to the hospital for the birth of my daughter. Tell you what, I think it was colder in the hospital room than on the trail. It was freezing. Even beyond that though, the shirt I am wearing right now also from Bespoke Post. I feel like it goes without saying, I really just love this company. The real beauty of it too, is that every single month they have new boxes across a huge variety of categories. And because they keep up with the seasons, they're great any time of year. Each box is valued at $70, but you only end up paying a fraction of that price. It's free to sign up and you can skip or cancel at any time. Plus you can get 20% off your first box of awesome when you head on over to boxofawesome.com and use promo code SUPER 
at checkout. That's going to be boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER at checkout for 20% off your first box. One last time, boxofawesome.com, promo code SUPER, link is in the description down below. So anyway, James and Lily die. The Fidelia's charm breaks. From there, how does everyone find out so quickly? Well, for starters, Bathilda Bagshot. Again, she's in Godric's Hollow. She probably discovered this almost the instant that it happened and immediately contacted Dumbledore. Then we have Sirius, who just by complete coincidence had also decided to check on Peter that very night. That one's not speculation, it's just true. So, but when he showed up at Peter's hiding spot, he discovered that no one was there and there hadn't been any sign of a struggle. So he started putting the pieces together and went to check on the Potters. That accounts for what happens next, which is that Hagrid and Sirius both show up at the Potter's residence in Godric's Hollow, but Hagrid must have gotten there first. What's kind of odd here is that Dumbledore must have gotten the news and the first thing he did was send Hagrid there to collect Harry before figuring any of the rest of it out for himself, because if he had gone there first, he just would have collected Harry, right? I'm just gonna say it, you'd certainly hope so. Hagrid will dig Harry out of the wreckage when Sirius shows up and asks to take him and Hagrid declines. At which point Sirius gives Hagrid the motorcycle and departs to hunt down Peter because he knows Peter is the actual secret keeper. And he definitely knows that because making it Peter instead of Sirius was Sirius's idea in the first place. But if you'd like to see what would have happened if Sirius had been the secret keeper, then well, video back in the card. Cunning as Peter is, he then yells at Sirius and blames him for the death of Lily and James Potter before he then cuts off his own finger and blows up the street, killing 12 muggles in the process. It's this incident that I have a feeling is what really caused the word to spread like wildfire because again, at least according to Fudge, there were 50 eyewitnesses. I suspect that it's after Hagrid has collected baby Harry that Dumbledore arrives on the scene to try to figure out what actually happened that night. Now this part is just speculation, but I actually think there's a fair bit to back the idea up. Take for example, when Harry and Dumbledore go to the cave where Voldemort's locket is hidden. Harry is just amazed at how Dumbledore is working through all of the various clues when Dumbledore explains, magic always leaves traces, sometimes very distinctive traces. I taught Tom Riddle. I know his style. So my suspicion here is that after Harry had been collected, Dumbledore arrived on the scene to basically do this exact same thing, to determine what the Potters and Voldemort's final moments were like. Not to stray too far from the main story here, but we also see in Fantastic Beasts, Newt use a similar kind of magic that kind of reveals the events of the night before. Interestingly though, before Dumbledore could have even arrived at Godric's Hollow, we also know that Peter had gotten there first to collect Voldemort's wand, which I don't immediately think he was trying to collect so that he could return it to Voldemort himself, but possibly because it could have implicated him as a traitor. This actually makes things even more interesting because it also means that Peter very quickly must have discovered that Voldemort's plan had failed. Obviously, he wouldn't want to be inside of his own home on this particular evening because he would know that Sirius would know that he was a traitor the moment that it was reported that Lily and James were dead. But he'd have no reason to think that Voldemort couldn't just protect him. Right? If anything, Peter is probably anticipating being like Voldemort's most trusted pupil by the end of this day. And as such, I think that the giveaway that something bad must have happened as far as the Death Eaters are concerned must have come in the form of the dark mark on their arms. If we fast forward to Goblet of Fire, we know that the effect works in the opposite direction as well, where as Voldemort is slowly building strength throughout the year, the dark mark on both Karkaroff and Snape's arms are getting darker. So if all at once Voldemort went from being essentially as close to his most powerful ever to defeated, the dark mark must have just completely disappeared, right? This would signal to Peter pretty quickly that something went super wrong. So from there, he would go to the Potters to investigate what happened, find Voldemort's wand and promptly flee, only to be cornered by Sirius later that day. That is a Sirius without his motorcycle, mind you, which again brings us back to Hagrid and what he was doing with Harry for this entire day. Well, here's the thing. The motorcycle is a kind of unaccounted for variable 
by Dumbledore when he sends Hagrid to collect Harry. We know that the first thing that must have happened is that Dumbledore discovered what happened at the Potters and then told Hagrid to go and collect baby Harry from Godric's Hollow and take him to Privet Drive. Information that Hagrid must have then promptly shared with Professor McGonagall based on what we know happens at Privet Drive. Dumbledore says, Hagrid's late. I suppose it was he who told you I'd be here, by the way. Yes, said Professor McGonagall. So as much as it absolutely seems like this is information that Dumbledore would have shared with McGonagall, the only person he actually tells is Hagrid. As a result, Dumbledore is not expecting her to be there at all, and McGonagall doesn't even realize that the home she's been sitting in front of all day is the last living relatives of Harry Potter. The other thing that we know about Hagrid in this particular instance is that as a half giant, he is unable to either apparate or fly by broomstick. Meaning when Dumbledore sent Hagrid on this particular mission, it's just all too likely that he expected it to take a full day for Hagrid to get Harry from Godric's Hollow to Little Whinging. So the full day later problem may just literally be explained by the fact that this is when they decided to meet on the basis of how long they expected it to take Hagrid to complete the mission. As it were, Hagrid picks up a much faster form of transportation and is still late. I personally like to assume that with all this extra time on his hands, Hagrid thought it would be a great idea to take baby Harry to a carnival so he could examine all of the dragons and other multi-headed creatures. And I say carnival, I meant jungle. Kids love jungles. Beyond that, we also know that Hagrid is just one of Dumbledore's most trusted pupils. And while maybe not always the most subtle of humans, is exceedingly gentle when it comes to dealing with dangerous beasts, or in this case, a 15 month old. As a proud parent of an 11 month old, I can actually see where this cross section was formed. So while Dumbledore may have known that it would take Hagrid longer to collect baby Harry, it's also probably the person he thought Harry would be in the safest hands with. And to be fair, He's not wrong. That being said, let's go ahead and attempt to recap what this evening actually looks like. First, we know that Voldemort appears at James and Lily's home where he goes inside and kills both of them before baby Harry is able to destroy what is left of Voldemort. From there, the Fidelius charm is broken, which Bathilda Bagshot notices and immediately contacts Dumbledore to let him know. Dumbledore then communicates with Hagrid and sends him on his way to go and collect baby Harry. While maybe not the fastest, Hagrid does end up being the first person on the scene, shortly followed by Sirius Black, who then loans him his motorbike. From there, Sirius leaves to go and hunt down Peter Pettigrew and Hagrid leaves to deliver Harry to the Dursleys. After that, Peter, knowing that something must have gone wrong with the plan, arrives on the scene, digs through the wreckage for something else, Voldemort's wand, and then promptly leaves. After that, Dumbledore arrives on scene in Godric's Hollow to figure out what happened inside of the house that evening. But there you go, guys. That is what happened on the evening of October 31st, 1981. Be sure to let me know what you think Hagrid and Harry could have done for an entire day of just leisure activities in the towel section down below. But otherwise, guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to learn more about why Dumbledore trusts Hagrid just so very much, we have an entire video about it right over here. Otherwise, until next time, bye.